out especially, and that's Justice Antonio Benjamin, who's uh, here in the front row, uh, who's been a champion for the environmental rule of law, international engagement on environmental issues, and discussing the discussion about the role of courts in the face of environmental crises. Uh, you know, I, I was trying to think of the right analogy for Justice Benjamin, you know, the straw that stirs the drink, the instigator, the, the, the sort of ringleader, whatever you want to call it. He's the one, I think, who, just through the sheer force of his personality and his sheer um, desire and, and, and sort of the goodness of his heart that is apparent in everything he does, I think has inspired people to come together and make these, these events possible. This is the second event of this type that's been held, and also I think that's one of the, one of the um, there have been perhaps three or four meetings of the Global Judicial Institute, but this is the second worldwide meeting that's been held in connection with uh, uh, just, justices and judges from this country. So I want to thank Antonio personally for all of his leadership. Can you please join me? We're uh, incredibly grateful to the organizational sponsors who uh, made this event possible, the Global Judicial Institute on the, Envir uh, on the Environment, which is the uh, organization that Antonio and the other individuals I met earlier have, have created to provide a forum for judges internationally to come together to talk about issues on the environment. The World Commission on Environmental Law, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which some of you may remember, I was here uh, in 2016, and we had a meeting of judges in this very courtroom, which was a landmark, I think, in these efforts. Uh, the General Secretary of the Organization of American States, and uh, Claudia DeWint is instrumental there. Uh, the UN Environmental Program and the Environmental Law Institute, which has been a highly effective, nonpartisan voice in shaping environmental law and policy for 50 years. We have Scott Fulton here today from them. Let's wish them a happy 50th birthday, I guess. Please join me in the house. students uh, from the school. I can't tell you uh, how proud I think Chief Justice Richardson, the namesake of that school, uh, my predecessor as Chief Justice on the court, and someone who was instrumental in the creation of the organization that the Conference of Chief Justices, of which I'm a member, uh, and the supporting organization, the National Center for State Courts, was instrumental in their formation. So I think he's got about three, big, three reasons to be smiling today. We're here in this courtroom he presided with such grace. We're bringing justices from across the nation here, uh, and students from the school that's named in his honor are here making all this happen. And I really want to thank those students for their time volunteering. Please join me in acknowledging their work. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, uh, we have colleagues uh, from an organization called the Conference of Chief Justices. It's a group. Uh, that was created um, actually quite some time ago and then affiliated with the National Center for State Courts about 50 years ago. As I said, C.J. Richard, Richardson was instrumental in forming what we call the NCSC. Uh, the conference brings justices from all 50 states and the territories together uh, to address issues that are of mutual interest to us. We've been working on issues uh, such as the opioid crisis, uh, criminal justice reform, civil justice reform, uh, are some of the issues that the conference has been uh, working on. And a couple of years ago, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Chief Justice Paul Reiber, and I began discussing the possibility of having an educational program around issues related to the environment, environmental issues. And I remember um, sitting in a, a hotel conference room in the basement of a hotel in Philadelphia at like 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning back in 2017. Uh, that was a, the slot we were able to get to pitch the idea, um, and uh, so I guess you know we only got people who really were interested at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning, and they were interested, and people were open, and from there the idea of having an uh, a program on the environment was born. It took uh, two, two and a half years to develop the educational program that the Chief Justices are going to be focusing on this week around environmental law and state courts and environmental courts. And at the same time that was happening, uh, the efforts of the Global Judicial Institute were beginning to unfold, and that organization uh, was gaining steam. And so we decided, uh, sort of between our two organizations, uh, that perhaps we could uh, have a meeting held at the same time in the same place, so that people who were coming from one would be able to uh, share in some of the events from the other. And that's, that's what's happening here this weekend. So 
I have several of my colleagues um, from the Conference of Chief Justices who will be here either today or tomorrow at the law school and able to share their thoughts and begin to engage with the Global Judicial Institute. Uh, one of them is here today, uh, Chief Justice Paul Ryder from Vermont, and please join me in acknowledging him. Now, each country uh, represented um, in the conference and here today, um, and indeed each of the 50 states of the United States, entrusts their judiciary with slightly different roles. And becoming thought a better, more thoughtful jurist uh, requires an openness to learning from others, uh, to seeking wisdom from a diversity of sources, and to finding compelling arguments and strong reasoning wherever they arise. So for us as judges, learning from our counterparts in other states and other countries is an essential way uh, to uh, expand our perspectives and ultimately become better at serving our communities. And that's really, to me, what Global Judicial Institute is about, is what the Conference of Chief Justices is about. Uh, and really, that's something that has been a priority for us here in the Hawaii judiciary. We have um, engaged with the uh, international judges from other nations in, in a variety of ways during the past five years. Um, the IUCN Congress, which I mentioned, uh, was really kind of a jump, a starting off point for that. Uh, we had, uh, again, judges from across the world were here in this very courtroom uh, for a series of amazing conversations. Uh, one day, I think it was a Saturday during the course of the Congress, uh, it was wonderful, uh, and began, I think, our recognition as a court. And I see my colleagues here scattered in the audience. I think for us, we realized the power of being able to have these conversations with uh, judges and justices from other nations. We followed that up by having visits from the uh, from India's Supreme Court, as well as the Supreme Tribunal. India's, uh, I believe, only the third country with a uh, nationwide court uh, dedicated solely to environmental cause, uh, causes. Uh, we had Justice Emmanuel Ojira Shabuya, who I think is here today for our conference in the front row, uh, president of the East Africa Court of Justice, uh, who came and talked to us about water rights issues and water justice. And so we have, it's a conversation we thought has been important as a court and a judiciary. And so this is a very natural uh, outgrowth of that interest and the amazing uh, uh, discussions we've been able to have over the last five years. It's also important to note that Hawaii is taking a proactive uh, approach to ensuring that our justice institutions have the capacity to reach just and consistent results in environmental cases through the creation of our environmental court in 2014. That was only the second statewide environmental court to be created in the United States. The first was Vermont, and I have to tip my hat to Chief Justice Ryber, they were there uh, 20 years ago. And uh, so they were really the pioneers on the statewide level. Although around the United States, you'll find courts dedicated to issues related to water. You'll find uh, municipal level courts uh, that are uh, related to environmental issues. But our two states were the first uh, to do this on a statewide level. So uh, really, uh, I think that's something that we hope to share uh, a little bit about our courts and also to learn about the models in other countries. But I have to acknowledge my friend um, Justice Wilson and our legislature for passing the legislation that authorized the creation of our environmental court back in 2014. Um, in the first four years of its existence, the court decided more than 4,000 cases. So it really has had an impact. And I think the, the, it really, the vision was to have judges who were spe uh, specially trained in the complex issues that they would have to address you know, on the calendars uh, that, they fit, uh, that they were sitting on for environmental matters and resource matters and been able to get them that training. And so really the vision of that court uh, I think has been achieved. Um, and it really it is an interesting model because I think unlike many other jurisdictions, our environmental court judges decide both criminal and civil cases. Uh, there are both our circuit courts deciding complex land use issues to our district courts. Uh, deciding what might seem like very local uh, resource related issues, when can you fish, what can you fish for, how can you fish, but issues that have profound impacts uh, when aggregated and uh, really are, are important in terms of the impact on that specific resource. So we're looking forward to sharing more about um, the court during the course of the symposium. We have several of our presiding judges, Jeff Crabtree and Joe Cardoza, I see are here in the audience, and I know they'll be presenting to you uh, so I think that's going to be very, very important and hopefully helpful for you. And again, we look forward to learning uh, more about other uh, environmental courts across the country. Um, I just like to close this morning with a story that reflects, I think, the new cultural heritage of Hawaii 
and speaks a little bit to the issues that we're here talking about. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, climate uh, change activist Greta Thunberg um, crossed the Atlantic twice in 2019 uh, to attend climate conferences in New York and her native Sweden in a climate control catamaran. Now, long before her journey, the impressive journey, uh, captured global attention, ancient Polynesian voyagers traveled in the Pacific Ocean using wayfaring. Without a compass or other tools, these voyagers relied on the stars, the sun, and the ocean swells to guide them to land. That's how the Hawaiian Islands were discovered and settled almost two millennia ago. In the 1970s, Native Hawaiians sought to revive the Hawaiian language and cultural practices that had been threatened to near extinction by Western contact and influence. And just as an aside, that's why for me, um, the cultural protocol you heard at the beginning today, and hearing that in this courtroom is so significant. Really, it, um, it, it, it's a prim primary importance for us to honor the host culture, the Native Hawaiian culture, and everything we do as a judiciary. It is one of two official languages in the state, and I think it's something that is really uh, is, is very important to us as a judiciary. That's why I was so grateful to them for being here this morning. A lot happened in the 1970s here in Hawaii. There was a renaissance uh, of Hawaiian language, of cultural practices, um, in the law, there were significant amendments made to our Constitution that realized in the Constitution protected uh, traditional Native Hawaiian rights. And another landmark accomplishment that took place was the construction of the Hokulea, a replica of an ancient uh, Polynesian voyaging canoe. Such a canoe hadn't been seen in more than 600 years. People with wayfaring skills required to navigate such a canoe using only signs of nature were few and far between. One traditional navigator was pivotal to fulfilling the vision of pulling Tahiti from the sea, traveling from Hawaii to Tahiti, was Mao Piailo, uh, who became a master navigator for Micronesia from the island of Satawal. Because of his willingness to share um, and help with us and to help reestablish the sea roads of Polynesia that once were commonplace, he was able to train navigators who then were able to guide the Hokulea a name which translates to Star of Gladness, from Hawaii to Tahiti in 1976, where it was met by 17,000 people uh, from that nation upon its arrival. Since then, the Hokulea has made voyages to destinations all over the Pacific and the world, and the Polynesian Voyaging Society has built a sister ship, uh, the Hikianalia, which integrates sustainable technology like photovoltaic cell-powered motor, no carbon footprint, and led by master navigators, the two vessels have gone as far as Aotearoa or New Zealand, the Galapagos Islands, South Africa, the Caribbean, and the east coast of the United States. On these voyages, the crews learned from <coughs> communities around the globe about local practices and sustainability. Nainoa Thompson is the president of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, a master navigator who was trained in the practice by Mao Piailo um, back in, uh, in the 1970s. And um, Nainoa brought, was part of the crew that brought um, the Hokulea back to Hawaii after that first trip to Tahiti. In 2017, he embarked on a 40,000 mile voyage called Malama Honua, Care for Our Earth, which took him and the crew and of Hokulea and Hikimanaia around the world, engaging world leaders such as Archbishop Desmond Tutu and former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on issues related to sustainability and the environment. We're very excited that Nainoa uh, will be speaking to the Chief Justices this week, which will give him an opportunity to share his unique perspective on the impact of climate change on the sea roads and indigenous peoples of the Pacific. I hope this story conveys the deep commitment of our community here in Hawaii to ensuring a future that preserves the natural world which we've inherited. We're proud to be hosting important conversations about how to accomplish that over the next several days. And I also take from this story an important lesson that even in the face of incredible challenge, through vision, hard work, and collaboration, great and enduring things can be achieved. Again, I want to extend my warmest welcome to Hawaii to all of our guests. We're thrilled to be able to share our beautiful islands and rich cultural heritage with you over the course of this two-day symposium. It provides a unique place for us to share visions about the role courts should play in advancing the environmental rule of law. I look forward to continuing this dialogue, this dialogue about these issues and learning from the brilliant and insightful speakers who will be sharing their ideas here today and have that dialogue extend long into the future. Thanks to each of you for providing that opportunity. Aloha and mahalo. Good morning.
morning, good greetings everyone. I'm Scott Fulton, the president of the Environmental Law Institute, and it's uh, really my honor and uh, privilege uh, to have an opportunity to be here as part of these proceedings, and for the Environmental Law Institute to have the opportunity to be one of the sponsors of, uh, of this gathering. Uh, <clears throat> many thanks to the Chief Justice and uh, Justice Wilson for the, for the vision. Uh, and uh, that's behind this uh, this convening. Um, uh, and he thanks as well to our international jurists for traveling far uh, to be with us here today. Uh, for the Chief Justices from the United States, for all the distinguished guests who are here, for uh, projecting through your presence uh, your belief and the value of an exchange of this kind. And what better? place than uh, a historic and majestic courtroom like this uh, in the most uh, beautiful place on the planet uh, to consider the, the critical role of the courts as guardians of the environmental rule of law. Um, I've had the opportunity and privilege to have been part of the global judicial conversation about natural resource conversation, uh, conservation for over 20 years now, uh, dating back to my time as a judge on the Environmental Appeals Board in Washington, D.C., uh, and my involvement in the United Nations Environment Program's Global Judicial Initiative. Uh, the idea behind that initiative was that the judiciary, uh, equipped with an understanding of environmental phenomenon, um, some basic legal tools, and with the, the charge to administer justice, uh, could be an important engine for environmental protection, um, even in circumstances when the other elements of government are failing or, are, or struggling. And the <clears throat> contribution of judges in the years <clears throat> since uh, contributions informed by um, collective and comparative experience uh, stand as testament to the premise behind that initiative, I believe. Uh, maybe a, just a word about the Environmental Law Institute. As the Chief Justice mentioned, a 50 year old institute by design, uh, a nonpartisan, non advocacy group uh, committed to the uh, elegantly simple idea of building effective governance and rule of law in the environmental space. Uh, the currency that we use for this work is knowledge transfer, um, and the mechanisms by which knowledge is transferred takes one of four forms. We're a publisher, we're an educator, we're a researcher, and we're a convener, uh, bringing uh, diverse interests and perspectives together around the important issues of the day. Just to give you a couple of examples of our work in these spaces, uh, as a publisher, um, we published the Environmental Law Reporter, which uh, over the history of ELI uh, has really been one of the premier environmental journals, uh, environmental law journals in the country. Um, and uh, beyond that, they have also published books. And I just want to mention that uh, it's a book that will be publishing uh, within the next two months uh, that is entitled Global Environmental Law, uh, written by Chief Justice Ricardo Lorenzetti uh, from Argentina, who is here with us. Uh, and uh, Pablo uh, Lorenzetti, I think it's our first uh, father-son uh, book that uh, ELI has had the privilege of uh, publishing. But this is a very important contribution to the body of thought about kind of the foundational um, principles behind environmental law and environmental protection. And we're appreciative uh, of, uh, of their investing the energy in bringing this book forward and the opportunity for us to publish it for them. Uh, on the education front, judicial education has been a cornerstone of ELI's uh, educational programming for, for many years. Um, uh, the nonpartisan, non-advocacy nature of, uh, of the institute uh, provides for kind of a natural affinity for government interests, including the courts. 
um, that we've uh, been, uh, we've had the opportunity to be invited in to uh, some 30 countries around the world over that 30 year period and uh, uh, have trained uh, thousands of judges at this point um, on the administration of justice in the environmental uh, context. Uh, and uh, Sandy Chump, raise your hand, Sandy. Sandy is the director of the Judicial Education Program at uh, ELI. Um, happy to have her with uh, here, her here with us. And uh, also wanted to mention that the, the the most recent addition to our education uh, program in the judicial context is the establishment of the um, <clears throat> of the uh, judges, uh, the Climate Judiciary Project. Um, and the idea behind this project is that there are an increasing number of cases uh, that are coming before the courts bearing climate implications, um, both in the so-called mitigation cases that are brought against uh, governments or greenhouse gas emitters seeking corrective measures or damages, um, but also a whole host of, uh, of land use, um, watershed management, uh, coastal zone planning decisions, and climate sensitive areas for which judicial review is being sought. So uh, working with two other nonpartisan entities, the Federal Judicial Center and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or AAAS, uh, the thought is to make some basic climate science education available to judges uh, what is known, uh, what is uh, not known, uh, what is uh, yet evolving. And we and our partners have just finished up a, a year of uh, pilot testing of that concept uh, with five pilot events with judges around the country. Uh, final one will be on March 13th in Atlanta. Um, the thought is that as this is seen as valuable um, by judges that uh, would lead to the development of a basic climate science judicial curriculum that could be made more broadly available. Um, and the preliminary response has been uh, quite positive. Uh, we also have uh, with us here today Paul Hanley, the former president of uh, Climate Central, a nonpartisan think tank who is now with us running uh, this uh, um, Climate Judiciary Project. Um, uh, Paul and Sandy are just coming from the Ninth Circuit where they did a, a, a program for them as part of our pilot testing of, of this. Uh, if anyone is interested in hearing more about this, I'm sure Paul and Sandy would be pleased to share at the margins of the meeting. Um, an example of ELI's research work um, is uh, a product that uh, we produced for the United Nations Environment Program last year called um, Environmental Rule of Law, First Global Report. Um, and the remainder of my remarks will really be uh, derived from um, that analysis. So uh, when we look at this report that was produced, uh, the starting point, of course, is uh, environmental rule of law, what we mean by that, and of course uh, what we mean most fundamentally is uh, the application of law uh, and the emergence of the rule of law in the environmental context. Um, but as, uh, as this report discusses in the environmental setting, uh, the rule of law actually has some special um, gravity, if you will. Um, there, there are long time horizons that associate with environmental phenomena, uh, and within those long time horizons, natural resource erosion can occur. Um, natural resource decline, uh, we increasingly understand, is connected to other important societal interests, like national security and stability. Um, and failure to protect natural resources often leads to uneven internalization of environmental costs and the pricing of goods and services, leading to an unlevel playing field for, um, for trade and commerce. Uh, and that unlevel playing field, of course, is the enemy of free and uh, fair trade. 
there's also an important connection to human rights in the environmental context. Um, the connection to the right to, to life, as some courts have understood it around the world. Um, the right to a clean and healthy environment, where such a right has been enshrined in a statute or constitution. Uh, the rights to enjoyment and utilization of property. So, uh, rule of law, uh, of course, matters in relation to any legal regime, but in the environmental context, the failure to achieve rule of law carries implications that reach far beyond the environmental laws themselves. Um, we've arrived at a fairly granular understanding of what the building blocks are for rule of law in the environmental context. Uh, there was a decision taken by the Governing Council for the United Nations Environment Program in 2013 uh, that spells out these building blocks. It refers to mutually supporting features that need to be present for the formation of the rule of law in relation to environment. And those features are familiar ones to all of us, but they're quite important under themselves and in relation to one another. They include access to information, uh, stakeholder participation in environmental decisions, public integrity in the environmental context, the coherent and efficient integration of government functions relating to environmental decision making, effective enforcement, and timely, impartial, and independent dispute resolution principally through the courts. Uh, these elements are, are highly interactive and mutually reinforcing and interdependent. For example, access to information and public participation are not uh, important just because we like these ideas in the abstract, but because they are key pieces in the accountability system. It's impossible to, to check unprincipled government decision making, for example, if there's not access to the information upon which those decisions are based and no vehicle for challenging those decisions. Uh, so these elements are, are best seen as links in a chain. Failure on any link risks collapse of the system, or at least rendering it less effective. And perhaps the most vital link in the chain of all is the judiciary. Validation of, of any regime of, of rights and obligations ultimately depends on the courts. Uh, the courts also serve to, to validate the, the societal priority that underlies those, those rights and obligations. In most societies, judges are among the most revered of public leaders, and what judges declare as important a society, a society comes to see as important. The courts also provide an outlet uh, for the ventilation of grievances. Without a, a law-based system that provides a, a regularized and predictable pathway for ventilating disputes, the aggrieved will use means outside the law to press the cause. And we see that in failing governance, circumstances arise in violence around the world as a means of resolving environmental disputes. More on that in a moment. Some findings from this report. Um, one very positive finding is, a, is enormous advance since 1972 over this past 50 year period in development um, and, uh, and promulgation of environmental law. In 1972, only a handful of countries around the world had framework environmental legislation. Today, virtually every country has an environmental framework law. Um, and, uh, and nearly every constitution uh, developed or significantly amended in the last 30 years um, includes environmental rights um, or commitments relating to the environment. Um, in total, 88 countries now have constitutionally protected environmental rights. Another 62 have provisions in their constitution that speak to the importance of environmental quality. Uh, and these constitutional provisions are proving impactful around the world. 
and Hungary uh, a constitutional right, prevented, it prevented an amendment to an agriculture law that, uh, that would have privatized protected land. In Costa Rica, the court used a constitutional right to force the government to promulgate fishing regulations. Uh, there's also been very rapid uh, development of collateral laws like whistleblower protections uh, and the rights of public engage engagement and access to information, uh, with most countries now having these basic protections. And there's been, a, uh, there's been great growth in the build-out of environmental institutions. Fifty years ago, there were only a handful of environmental agencies uh, around the world. Now, every country has an institution of some kind focused on environmental questions and is taking the form of a ministry in the vast majority of countries. So, uh, the good news is uh, a lot of progress in uh, legal architecture, uh, in the opportunities um, for stakeholder engagement, um, for the building of institutions. But the difficult news is that this report also finds that uh, enormous implementation gaps uh, abound um, around the world, uh, and that we have a, a serious uh, environmental rule of law gap. Um, some gap indicators of concern that we need to pay attention to the continued decline in species around the world. Um, we're in a very negative trend line there, it's cause for great concern. The continued decline in the natural resource base in many countries, and with development uh, continuing to outpace protection in most of the world, an increase in environmental violence, with over a thousand environmental activists assassinated over the last 15 years. <coughs> that number um, and uh, uh, is on the rise, unfortunately. So. Um, there are problems, and it's a bad time for a rule of law gap, um, with climate change and species pressures continuing to compound current challenges. We, we really need our systems to work. The major contributors to um, the problems that we see um, include, um, first and perhaps foremost, corruption. Uh, this is a very common and chronic issue that masks environmental conditions and impedes interventions. Uh, and we find that countries that are heavily reliant on natural resources as a source of the gross domestic product uh, are particularly at risk from, from corruption, uh, especially when government controls access to the resources. So studies uh, comparing countries with similar social and economic conditions find that natural resource wealth greatly increases the likelihood of corruption, and this produces the so-called natural resource curse. The other major issue, non-compliance. Since one of the key tenets of rule of law is that law is observed in practice, that the uh, law, in fact, rules and the activities and affairs of those who are covered by the law, it's no wonder that non-compliance would impede rule of law formation. Indeed, as observed in the report, compliance is the strongest indicator of environmental rule of law. But the unfortunate reality is that non-compliance remains a, a major problem around the world with the failure to enforce or an effective or uneven enforcement standing as major contributors to non-compliance. So as a result, we are, uh, we're not realizing the promise of the laws that we have on the books. Uh, this is, of course, a, a place where the, the courts have a, a vital and important role to play. Uh, one quote from the report, a strong and independent judicial system where environmental law can be enforced is essential to creating a culture of compliance, preventing environmental harm before it occurs rather than only addressing it after the fact. So, um, the end of this report, and I'll wrap up my remarks.
remarked here is that there has been progress, and we should feel good about the progress that has occurred, uh, particularly in the, in the process of developing the law, uh, but uh, an enormous amount of work remains to be done, uh, which makes uh, all the more important the, the sharing of experiences, approaches, and best practices through symposia like this. Thank you. Aloha, good morning. I knew that Professor Antonini we would reduce my time. It's so good to know our friends. That's why I decided not to use my PowerPoint, because it's so difficult to reorganize PowerPoints when uh, we are told you have five minutes less than the uh, original time. Let me begin thanking the Chief Justice and uh, the Justice of this Court for welcoming us here. I have told the Chief Justice many times, and my other friends from the Court, Justice Wilson, Justice McKinney, uh, that we feel at home in Hawaii and we feel at home at the Supreme Court. And a lot of this has to do with the leadership of the Chief Justice. I uh, tend to say that one way that we should not define a judge is to say that he is a good judge or she is a good judge. Because we have to be good judges by duty. So when looking for something special to define a judge, let's find something else. And with Justice uh, Reckenwald, it's so easy to define him. Because we meet him, and he's one of those very few judges that carry a sign on the forehead, I am a good human being. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to me, <clears throat> That's um, something that should be required in an exam to become a judge. <laughs> should be a requirement for any confirmation. But we know it's not like that. So we are very privileged, Mark, to have you as Chief Justice at this court with your leadership and making with your colleagues uh, this Supreme Court, the Judiciary of Hawaii, the center stage for the debate on the environmental rule of law. I would like also to thank you. I that I'm not alone in this assessment. I would like to thank uh, Chief Justice Ryder that I met in, in DC. And immediately I realized that, oh, here is another good human being. And someone that is really interested in uh, the environmental rule of law. Of course, coming from Vermont, it's almost a necessity. Uh, the same applies to in Hawaii. But I would like to highlight this aspect uh, that you impress us very much for uh, this easiness uh, and this willingness to share your knowledge, the knowledge of your communities but also to accept that knowledge is a universal concept and a universal value that needs to be shared by everyone. Let me thank my colleagues that put this uh, event together and allow me, um, Justice Michael Wilson, to thank um, Professor Denise Antolini because she really represents this amazing group of people that helped us in with this extraordinary uh, event. Uh, ELI, uh, Scott Fulton thought that Mark was set, saying that he is 50 years old. <laughs> <laughs> he was so happy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he realized that it was not about him, but about him. Claudia Wing, that is somewhere here, the Organization of American States, and Ray, Ray from um, UNEP, 
uh, my colleagues from around the, uh, the world, uh, this scholars of their year, uh, people that work uh, with judges and help judges. I thought I would just have a few reflections on, uh, on us judges. We don't stop to think about us. We think about others. In fact, it gives us great delight to be deciding the lives of other people. But what about us? And us vis a vis an important challenge as the protection of the environment. We judges are, first of all, trained to direct our attention to the past and the present. No wonder we are called agents of the status quo. And in fact, we are the keepers of the status quo. That's not bad, because this is entrenched in the constitutional framework that we are part of, and we are the voice of this constitutional uh, framework. But this is problematic for the protection of the environment, because protecting the environment <coughs> is looking towards the future. And no wonder that uh, Professor Louise <coughs> Antonini and, and her colleagues uh, gave this challenging title to our value, Judiciary <coughs> and Environmental Rule of Law, Adjudicating Our Future. And I will explore this a little bit. Perhaps it was not intentional, but it, it is very rich in terms of analyzing our approaches <coughs> and our profession. So we, we are trained in law schools to be taught for the end of judges. But we know that in the environmental context, we have to be reasonably in the judges. And this is so difficult. And we don't realize that this dilemma is permanently up with us. We always say, look, we have preliminary injunctions and all sorts of measures that we can use in order to deal with future events. But things that are about to happen <coughs> with the face sometimes. Second, we adjudicate others' interests, not ours. In fact, if we were to, to face an interest that we consider ourselves part of, we, have, we would have to reduce ourselves. Pay attention to the title of the event. Adjudicating our future. It's the future of judges as well. It's the future of their families. So we are, in fact, and we need to realize this, we are deciding about the future. <coughs> and I cannot salvage all sorts of legal repercussions that this would have um, in, in our daily practice. Third, in many, many parts of the world, this might sound strange to a US audience, but judges are trained to adjudicate individual cases at most collective cases, not local cases. Even in the United States, they are not trained to adjudicate global cases. <clears throat> and of course, the US is the mother land of all public interest litigation, went beyond the English model of class action, you name it in terms of collective interest, but not global interest. And that's made the difference here between international interest and global interest. It's not the black helicopters. It's something that affects all of us, even when we have no international framework that would protect uh, the global commons. Fourth, we adjudicate cases uh, among parties 
that have their say under the principle of due process. And we assume that we are not causing what we <coughs> call legal collateral damage. However, in many environmental cases, and especially the ones dealing with climate change, we might be protecting parties that are not there but have legal representation through the techniques that we develop in, in civil procedure, but parties that would be affected negatively by our decisions are not present. Those that would be losing their jobs, for example. Or who would find more difficult to find to, uh, to get a position in the area that he or she was trained. <coughs> and that area would be blacklisted, so to speak, by the judicial decision. So it is possible, and we need to twist the legal system, that one single decision of a judge affects posit positively millions of people, but at the same time affects negatively thousands of people. <clears throat> and we need to be mindful of that. Furthermore, we are used to adjudicating cases with no or little use of science. I find it fascinating when we have those environmental law training programs. Uh, Scott and Paul who is sitting beside <laughs> uh, the scientists, uh, and we are debating science. But 99.9% .9 of the cases decided by the judges don't involve science, or at least science in the complexity that we are talking about in terms of the biological crisis or um, the climate change crisis. And we have a problem, which is to make judges aware of the <coughs> scientific foundation of those legal issues. Of course, we can only say that other legal disciplines that bring in extreme scientific challenge. Intellectual property, for example, nanotechnology, software, now artificial intelligence. But here we have the parties with a strong interest in educating the judges on those uh, scientific issues involved. In environment law, often the plaintiff is, the, and I'll come back to that later, is the weakest party that can barely afford to be in front of the court. So we have to find ways in which the scientific knowledge is channeled to the judge in a manner that does not impact due process. In addition to all this, we are, as judges, used to adjudicating conflicts about the use, positive use, of natural resources. That's how property law developed. And if there is one area of law in which common law is more Roman law than we civil law countries, is property law. So, water conflicts, it's about use. And then comes environmental law, and an important piece of environmental law is about non-use. <coughs> this is a paradigm shift in the way we operate. And then, of course, this opens the opportunity for those that want to continue playing business as usual, to say that environmental law is anti-development. And in saying this, this is, doesn't come as a legal argument. This comes as a political argument, but it's in fact an ethical or anti-ethical argument. 
because environmental law is not anti or pro environmental law uh, development. Environmental law is neutral in this vis a vis development. But it's not neutral vis a vis unsustainable development. So, Let's make this clear. We are not against progress. We are, in fact, in favor of civilized progress, which includes a number of aspects that uh, include the, um, especially the, the rule of law that Scott Fulton mentioned a minute ago. <coughs> we are trained to adjudicate cases among private parties. This sounds almost as uh, a stupid statement that I'm making in the United States. Because you sue the government all the time. <clears throat> but in many parts of the world, the rule still is the king can do no wrong. The king being the state. And there are countries in which NGOs can uh, bring um, suits, public interest suits, but against private parties, not um, um, government. So, again, here we, we have uh, a challenge that requires reflection. Since in the government, either by action or inaction, <coughs> many times is the worst perpetrator of environmental violations in the world. And this can be done in a, in a global um, <coughs> sphere, not just in, in the local state or in, within the national boundaries. And then it's not where I'm approaching the <laughs> She looks very sweet. <laughs> very deceiving. <laughs> and I tried to avoid not look at her. <laughs> Let me add a few more uh, points and then I come. We are trained to adjudicate cases in which nature and its elements are the object. An object of legal relations. Not subjects of legal relations. And not entities with standing to sue. This is probably the easiest challenge we have. And in the English language gives us a wonderful example. This. You call a she. She. <coughs> not eat. In, in Latin language we call it eat. You call it she. And we have legal person. But still, this is an area in which only now we see judges deciding cases about the legal status of nature. Some constitutions, like Ecuador, Bolivia, went beyond and recognized uh, legal personality to nature, Pachamama. And it comes with all the symbolism of um, the pantheon of the pre Columbian uh, people. So, Pachamama, and I think in Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, tell us, help us. <clears throat> How can I treat Pachamama in a legal case? Because it's stated expressly in the Constitution that Pachamama has rights. Doesn't say 
capacity of the patient. So this is an area of environmental law that is developing uh, very, very fast. But it goes beyond just nature, mother nature, Pachamama. The elements themselves of the environment, forest, air, water, mountains, oceans, are developing, are moving from the objects position to something that we don't know uh, exactly what it will be. So our colleague Tolosa, good friend of Alores Anthony, Mike, myself, and uh, wonderful justice from the Supreme Court of Colombia, <coughs> recognized the Amazon, the forest, as a legal entity. Of course, there is a constitutional framework in Colombia that would allow for that. It's not ex explicitly explicit as in the Ecuadorian or the Bolivian. We adjudicate environmental cases looking at laws and regulations because constitutions do not <coughs> recognize a clear right to clean and safe environment. It's misleading to say that over 100 constitutions of the world recognize the environment. They do. But a large number of those constitutions have so vague language or make a direct reference to legislation, so it's basically policy, that the constitutional provision is meaningless. The US is one of the few cases, as um, you didn't say openly, perhaps I should not remind everyone, but the US Constitution is one of the very few in the world, for obvious reasons, understandable reasons, that formal reasons, that doesn't have uh, a word of the environment. The framers at that time were not aware of this importance, of this important value. But there are other constitutions, like the Constitution of Germany, which <coughs> does have beautiful language in the text, but it does not recognize a right to a clean and safe environment. So, somehow, environmental claims become sort of second class type of suit, because it is not in the Constitution. Finally, uh, two more points. We adjudicate cases, and I hope on this point each one of us give a minute of thought. You begin. You did. We adjudicate cases in which the plaintiffs or victims might be assassinated for claiming their rights. This is probably the tragedy of the commons. It's not the traditional, the hardened tragedy of the commons. This is the mega tragedy of the commons. That people are threatened their families for protecting something on our behalf. Back to the title of this event, our future. And that's how we society pay back. Of course, those people don't expect any payback, positive one, but definitely not that they are going to die or their family will be in danger. So here, environmental cases get much closer to organized crime cases in which we need to find ways to protect the plaintiffs and their lawyers than 
closer to more European types of legal um, disciplines. <coughs> and my last point is that we, I said it's the best, but just to, I have one more, <laughs> which is the very best. <coughs>
So that's the only thing that we judges should not accept is to say that we are the judges of contracts, the judges of property, the judges of law in family cases, but we are not judges that decide about survival. I, uh, when I woke up this morning, I had the I am a human on my forehead. I think that was what you were saying. <laughs> and uh, the, you know how I knew that? Because at 3 o'clock, when I woke up, my time, my time, not Hawaii time, 3 o'clock, my time, well, 3 o'clock back there, I opened the window. <laughs> and, you know, the ocean. And the breezes and the, and the, and the smells uh, just uh, came flooding into my world uh, in a wonderful reminder uh, of the essence of uh, our common human nature. Uh, this is uh, such a wonderful place to be, and I thank my good friend Mark Rectinwald for hosting this conference here. Uh, today and tomorrow. Unfortunately, I'm not able to attend tomorrow because of the other conference that Mark and his court uh, are hosting, which is the Midwinter Conference of Chief Justices. Chief, some of uh, our colleagues are here in the room. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. <clears throat> People are coming from all over the country, in fact, around the world to attend this. Uh, and as Mark alluded to earlier in his remarks, we have identified uh, environmental law as the principal focus of our uh, panel. Some of you who are here uh, with us today are going to speak on these panels uh, over the next few days, and I thank you for that. Um, my uh, general point, the remarks I want to make to you here uh, today, uh, has to do with the importance of our relationships in conferences like these, uh, conferences uh, like that, uh, that we are going to attend to over the next several days here in our room. Uh, the relationships that we form with uh, people from very different backgrounds and experiences. Uh, and one of the things that I was reflecting on while I was listening to the previous speakers in this context uh, was the experience that we had in Vermont over a number of years ago when uh, through the, uh, uh, the relationships that one of our uh, judges had established with the International Association of Women Judges, and Meredith knows about this, um, we, we, we began hosting uh, three or four or five uh, women judges from Afghanistan every year in Vermont. In Vermont, uh, you know, they, they would come over dressed, of course, in their traditional uh, clothing, and then they would spend two weeks in Vermont <laughs> and a week in Washington D.C. I kind of like that relationship, to be honest with you. You know, that's a pretty <laughs> that's a pretty. I like to make that point. You know, they spent two weeks with us and one week in Washington. That's, that's uh, you know that to me meant a lot. And I uh, recall uh, one in our book they would come for two weeks. One of the weeks was was to attend judicial college. Uh, we had judicial college in June. Uh, many uh, state court systems uh, do this. It's uh, to uh, it's at the end of the legislative session, so. Some of the training is about uh, new uh, law that the uh, legislature has passed and the governor has signed, uh, but that's not the only focus. We typically adopt a focus in a specific discipline. Uh, up until about five, six, seven years ago, maybe even ten years ago, we held a college at the Breadloaf campus of Middlebury College. Uh, and if any of you know, Middlebury College, Breadloaf, well, the, you know, the whole state of Vermont is very rural and bucolic in many other ways. The, 
the Middlebury College has this summer campus, uh, which is nestled in the in the arm of the Green Mountains, uh, probably about 20 or 30 miles away from uh, the main campus itself, in a incredible, incredibly beautiful place, almost up on the spine of the Green Mountains, not quite there. Uh, a, an arrangement of uh, wooden structures, these are not modern buildings, uh, dormitories uh, and meeting halls, but all of uh, some age and timber, if you will. And I'll never forget, <clears throat> to give you some of the background of this, walking to class one morning from my dormitory room, walking down the walk towards the main meeting hall, and here were the four uh, women. Judge, we only, incidentally, only women judges came uh, to the state of Vermont. Women judges, by the way, in Afghanistan, when the Taliban took over, were banished from the bench. Banished from the bench because of uh, their perception. Many of these women, by the way, people of tremendous courage, I, I still can't get over this <laughs> to this day, many of these women set up, who were, who, were, who were kicked off the bench, set up schools for girls in the basements of their houses, violating the rules, of course, taking a great risk, a personal risk for themselves and their families. So here's this image I've got. I'm walking to class one morning. Four, they traveled with two interpreters. This was a state of department project. Uh, and the um, interpreters uh, were Afghan, very wonderful people who reside in, in our country here. And they um, were with them. But the women were all in burqas with an, an Adirondack chair. I know in a different part of the world, but you all know what Adirondack chairs are, those classic sort of New England wooden chairs with tall backs and, you know, and their shoes were off and their bare feet in the grass and they were talking about themselves. I always used to say, and I still don't to hear, that we learn more from them than they from us. After dinner, we would all have meals together during this period of time, and after dinner, frequently, the women through the interpreter would talk about their experiences back home. And in Kabul, for instance, uh, then, I, don't, I have no uh, information about what the status is now, but back then, 15 years ago probably, uh, they were uh, rationing electricity uh, so that they might have in their courts, in the middle of the day, six hours of electricity. Eight hours of like four hours of electricity. I always wondered, and we asked them, and we talk about how do you maintain uh, a system of due process under this circumstance? How do you how do you give notice? How do you how do you deliver notice? Where does it go? How do you so it just it it, it confounded me. Now, yeah, here. So I sound like you know I got the higher hand here. There are uh, there are tough problems. I got a higher hand. You know, about four or five years after the start, one summer, I met with them. And by the way, we would have different uh, judges that would come over and we have the same group. And um, we had faced, I think this was in 2008, when the, we had a severe economic crisis in this country. We had faced a terrible time with funding in the court system in Vermont. I mean, I, I could go into this in detail, but it was it was off. I mean, one rescission notice after another, after another, after another, out of the executive branch. And by the way, when you get a rescission notice four or five, six months into the current fiscal year, you have much less time in which to balance the books, given what it is that they've taken away that they previously had given. And so here, I was struggling with this. And I decided they should know what the pressures are that we face here. And I told them about it. I said, we have gone to the point where we are closing courts 
every single court in the state. I'm still embarrassed to tell you this because I think it is uh, in some measure. You know, I, I worry about letting the people down that we serve. This is what I have always had a concern for. And uh, we were closing courts up to two days a month, every single court in the state, every single court in the state. Um, and I remember when I told them about this, the look on their faces. We did, you didn't need an interpreter at that point to translate. Uh, their language anymore. I, the look on their faces when I talked about closing every single court, an experience that each of them had had. So I come back to my original point, which is the <coughs> advantage of meetings like this, of conferences like this, of coming together and speaking to one another about our, our very diverse uh, backgrounds is to bring context to the problems we face uh, and to share experiences in how to address them. I spoke, uh, I was really very, very privileged to preside over the Conference of Chief Justices last year. And in the opening remarks I gave uh, in uh, August of uh, 2018, when I took that office on, I, we were in New York, <coughs> Rhode Island for that meeting, and I mentioned to the Chiefs, Mike, you might remember this, I said, you know, one of the powerful things, remember, this is 50 states, we are not a homogenous, we, we are not a country that lives all under the same exact uh, set of uh, uh, thoughts and beliefs and uh, ideals, as I think you probably know. There's a great conflict, a deepening conflict in our country in a way that is, uh, is quite concerning. But I said, you know, if, if we've got justice, chief justices from every single state in the country and all of the U.S. possessions, my good friend Reese Hodge from the Virgin Islands is here. Um, so this is a very, very diverse background. We talk about uh, the, uh, the environment. We've got oil producing states, states that where chief justices, I've just told you a story about my own budget, right? Chief justices from states that depend upon funding to support their obligation and responsibility under their individual constitutions to deliver on the promise of a rule of law and access to justice. These are people that worry about the threat to their economy. And so we are uh, in a situation in that conference that I find very powerful myself. I think there's great strength in this because we don't come together to debate back and forth about this law or that law. What we do is come together to talk about what binds us, what is common, what is our common interest. So in, that, in those remarks a year and a half ago, I said, if, if on the streets of Newport, Rhode Island, we went outside and took randomly 10 people off the street, brought them in here to our meeting, and said to them, uh, tell us uh, what uh, these states have in common, Kentucky, Texas, Rhode Island, Vermont, Pennsylvania, Florida, Hawaii, what do they have in common? Nine out of 10 of those people would say, blue state, red state. That's sort of a sad commentary on where we are, by the way, I think. But the truth is that we, when we get together, we're not talking about that. We are talking about what it is that we have in common and the strength that we can bring to our responsibilities under the constitutions and the rule of law that we serve. And I find great power in that. I spoke to the American Bar Association at their, at their midwinter meeting last year, and I talked to them about this same subject and the fact that this whole idea of categorizing red states and blue states in, in my country, I find very offensive. I find very, very offensive. 
You know, everybody thinks when I say I'm from Vermont, everybody goes, oh, Bernie Sanders. Bernie, <laughs> 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 they want to know, do you know Bernie? <laughs> Blue State, right? Blue State. I say, come on. You can't possibly think everybody in my state thinks exactly the same way. So much so that you can actually paint a color on their forehead and say, this is who they are. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's disturbing. It's disturbing. <laughs> so I think that one of the real great strengths of conferences like these, of the effort that the good people who put this conference together it's not only to talk about the substantive issues of the law relating to environment and environmental protection and environmental justice. Uh, and, and Antonio, I was sobered by some of your comments. I want to come back to it in a second. But the, but, the, but the idea that we have uh, substantive things in common that we only are going to discover if we're talking about and so you all have made a great effort to be here today. And I thank you for that. I thank you for that. I, I honor each and every one of you for that. Um, here's an example of what I'm talking about. And I was, again, sitting there next to Mike and Mark, thinking about this and looking at this wonderful world. I love courtrooms, by the way. I love courtrooms. <laughs> I mean, not because I spent a lot of time in a courtroom, if you go back, they all are fundamentally the same. Go into a courtroom in some other place, not only in this country, in the world, right? In the world, go into a courtroom. This structure is fundamental, it's basic. Jurists, litigants, advocates, and the process. Give and take, give and take. So okay, what do we have here? We've got the great seal of the state of Hawaii. And I, by the way, I would love to know what the translation is of that, but I'm not going to put it on. Ice court. It's what? Ice court. Yeah. Is that what the translation is? Okay. But look at the seal. I don't know this for sure, but my bet is that what is represented by the lines that are in the upper left-hand quadrant and in the lines on the lower right-hand quadrant are a nod to agriculture. Am I right? Am I wrong? Huh? Is it right? And the, and the, the, the two globes on stocks are, <coughs> are trees? Huh? Maybe not. Genesis, the origin of all the 
states in this country. And he said, I, I was surprised to find out that Vermont wasn't one of the original states. We were the 14th state, and we were not in the original. So we had our own freestanding constitution from 1777, I want to say 77, I don't think it's 76, 1777 to 1791 when we were admitted to the U.S. Freestanding constitution, and we had a constitutional scholar that came and spoke when Vermont hosted the Conference of Chief Justices in Burlington several years ago. Um, and one of the things he said was, when you think about the importance of state constitutional jurisprudence, reflect on Vermont's history. You were developing the law under your constitution. Nobody else, just, just, just you, for 14 years. Not only were we developing the law, we had a constitutional convention along the way in 1787, about the same time as the U.S. And we amended our Constitution through a process in which we recognized the importance <coughs> of separation of powers, made it an express provision in the Constitution as amended. Uh, to me, the evidence of the power and the importance of, state, of states and their devotion to the law and to the development of their law under their individual constitutions is a great strength to this country in that we all contribute in this way to the development of a common set of principles that we all find important and underlying the work that we do. And I would suggest to you very respectfully that every country represented here, every jurisdiction represented here, we have these same, this same focus in mind. We come together at these kinds of meetings, at this conference in particular, in order to plow that ground and, 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 and try to develop deeper understandings about our own jurisprudence, about our own uh, uh, rules of law in this particular way with regard to the environment. You know, Vermont is held up as an ideal in many ways with respect to environmental concerns. We aren't perfect. We are not perfect, and we uh, actually struggle today with challenges to the processes that were adopted now 50 years ago in my state with Act 250. Act 250, the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Act 250 is this year. 50th anniversary, 50 years ago, uh, the state legislature in Vermont adopted this very far-reaching uh, set of uh, statutes that was intended to try to control development in a way that would moderate it with respect to uh, concerns about agriculture and protection of the environment. And about three years ago, the legislature decided that it wanted to take a look at the development of this law over this period of time and what the future holds, and they convened a commission uh, that uh, actually issued a report just a year ago, the Act 250 Commission, in which many recommendations for changes, substantial changes in the law have been made. For one, uh, they recommended more attention being paid to the climate in the, in the criteria that the local commissions evaluate in determining whether or not to issue a permit. They, paid, uh, they made recommendations with regard uh, to forest management and concerns about the partition of uh, forestry blocks through uh, utility lines and uh, development and roads in a way that has uh, affected uh, the ecology and the life. Um, they've made recommendations also with regard to process. And this is a reflection of the pressures that I think we see with regard to these issues in every jurisdiction 
that is talking about, and hopefully everybody is, this important subject of protection of the environment and environmental justice. Because uh, the reform, as proposed, we substantially, have I run out of time to these? Okay. I have one minute. Have one minute? You said I had 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I got set up by Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> and it all started. Let me just say, we're not. <laughs> it started with Scott. Uh, yeah, that's what I was. I was um, but the, the uh, you know, there are a lot of people who uh, complain about the permit process, and and so substantial revisions are recommended to the permitting process. I don't know where it's going to go. I, it, it's it's now a year into our legislative term, uh, where they're talking about it. I think there are going to be some changes. I don't think this is unusual, and I think it's, um, it's uh, something that we deal with. I think that we are going to find this uh, in any body of law that is as far reaching as this one, that there will be challenges, and there will be reaction, and there will be the development of jurisprudence around those those new policies that are adopted. So, let me conclude because I don't want to violate the rule um, that, uh, again, I'm so pleased to be here. I'm very grateful for the participation of everyone who has uh, joined us here uh, today. Again, I want to thank you, Mark 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 for his leadership on this issue. Uh, without that, Mark, I don't think I would be. So I really appreciate that. Thanks very much.